Okay, colleagues, uh, Excellency Ambassador, uh, distinguished guests, uh, allow me to welcome you uh, to our session today, which is looking at uh, bioeconomy for climate uh, resilient development. Um, this session is hosted uh, by the Stockholm Environment Institute together with the government of Kenya through the Kenya Mission to the United Nations Environment Program. Uh, and is actually part of a series of events that we are hosting as part of raising the profile of the scientific uh, information uh, and evidence that exists towards helping address the planetary crisis, and uh, more specifically addressing the challenge of biodiversity crisis and the challenge of climate crisis. Uh, as you know, this year is a very important year because for the first time we have the Conference of Parties uh, meetings to the three uh, Rio conventions, the Convention on United Nations Convention on um, Biodiversity, which will be hosted by Colombia. And we are very uh, gracious here to have Ambassador, uh, Permanent Representative of Colombia to uh, UNEP joining us today. Um, we will also have the Conference of Parties, COP29, uh, for climate change uh, in Baku, Azerbaijan. And later on in December, we'll have the conference of parties uh, meeting, the 16th meeting to the United Nations Convention on Desertification. So we, as Stockholm Environment Institute, we have a series of events that are trying to really uh, bring in the scientific community to share some of the evidence that exists uh, when it comes to uh, the research. Um, and particularly, we are looking at how to address climate change and biodiversity. We are specifically collaborating with the, um, leadership of the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and IPBES, uh, the Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. Um, each of the centers that we have in uh, Colombia for Latin America, uh, in Asia, in Bangkok for uh, Southeast Asia for Asia, and our headquarters have had some events uh, touching on these two topics. And for the Africa Center, our focus has been on biodiversity and bioeconomy. So today we are privileged that um, we've lined up a series of speakers. We have the chair of the, the governmental platform on biodiversity and ecosystem services, uh, David Obura, who will give us a keynote, uh, which will follow then with a panel discussion. And the panel, we have uh, a diverse um, participation in the panel. Uh, so we'll have uh, colleagues from the panel uh, from United Nations Environment Program. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Thierry uh, Oliveira, who is working on the economics uh, of biodiversity. Uh, we have the vice chair for the working group two for the IPCC, uh, Professor Cromwell Lucorito, uh, who will also join us to share perspective around um, linkages between biodiversity and climate, uh, specifically focusing on the okay. ongoing so, IPCC seventh assessment I cycle. Have a problem with my speech, um, and we expect uh, Dr. Lufonso Somorin from the Africa Development Bank will share for us perspectives around financing and how to uh, integrate financing for both biodiversity and climate. We also are paying attention to the young people. We have a young negotiator uh, for the UNCCD, uh, Patricia Combo, who, who will also share with us the perspective from uh, the young people uh, on these matters. Uh, later on, uh, and this is very important because um, we want this event to showcase some of the major um, events that we have in this month in, in Colombia, in Cali, we will have the 16th conference of parties meeting to the CBD. We would like to hear from uh, Ambassador, Your Excellency, uh, Pedro Ruiz, about what is the vision of the COP16 uh, presidency um, and how can we um, uh, you know, be able to support that in terms of the science and what is the expectation from the scientific community. And we'll also have uh, Dr. Julia Seshuru, who is the coordinator of the um, BioInnovate program, which is hosted at the International Center for Insect Physiology and Ecology, and also a co-chair for the Global Bio Bioeconomy Summit, which will be held here in Nairobi uh, on the 23rd and 24th of October. So, um, Excellencies, that uh, sets the stage for uh, our conversation today. We'd like to uh, uh, invite also our online participants. We had uh, um, a registration of up to about 130 uh, as at uh, two hours ago. So I'm sure that uh, we probably have many more. So there's quite a lot of interest uh, from different parts of the world, different parts of uh, 
um, you know, in Asia, in Africa, in, uh, in, in Europe, and in America. We also have quite a diverse registration in terms of uh, government uh, representative, private sector, civil society, um, and, and the scientific community. So allow me at this stage uh, to invite um, uh, our co-host of the event. Uh, I would like to check if she's online, Ambassador Gertrude Angote, the permanent representative of Kenya to the United Nations Environment Program. Is Ambassador Angote online? Yeah. Okay, sorry, I understand. Ah, okay, okay, I see. Uh, okay, in that case, what we'll do is we will um, we will have the, the submission of Ambassador Ngote uh, later on. Uh, I, I suggest that we uh, then just uh, proceed towards uh, getting the keynote address uh, from Dr. Bura. And Dr. Bura is traveling, so he gave us a recorded uh, keynote address. So I would request the secretariat um, to get us the keynote address. Secretariat. Good afternoon. Uh, it's my pleasure to be with you uh, today, uh, virtually, even though I can't be there in person. Uh, my name is David Obura. I'm a director of Cordio East Africa. We're a marine research organization based in Mombasa in Kenya. And I'm also the current chair of the Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, or IPBES. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Osano and the SEI Africa Center for inviting me to give this keynote presentation. And even though I can't be there with you, I hope this will be uh, of relevance and interesting, and I look forward to follow up from that. Now, my role is from the IPBES perspective, we work on biodiversity and ecosystem services. So that's to talk about integrating climate and biodiversity solutions in support of a bioeconomy for climate resilient development. Now in IPES, we have developed a conceptual framework that organizes all the work that we do, all the assessments that we have conducted since 2016. And this is a simplification of that conceptual framework up in the upper left. This was developed at the same time as the sustainable development framework was really uh, maturing, the sustainable development goals, all built around the three pillars, so nature, economy, and society. I won't go into detail in the conceptual framework itself because it is quite complicated, but I'd like to explain it in the context of the relationships between nature, economy, and society, because I think there's a lot of uh, general principles that we can derive from this to guide future work. So the basis of our conceptual framework is that nature supports economy through our direct uses of natural resources that we extract, the various commodities that we trade in, um, that these are really provided through ecosystem goods and services or the broader framework of nature's contributions to people, which I'll explain in a moment. Now, economic activities provide societal benefits. Uh, these are the income, the health and prosperity uh, that we benefit from uh, our communities and societies. And of course, there's issues of equality of distribution around the sharing of those benefits. And then in return, societal values, uh, the governance systems that we have, the preferences that we express, our market values, these really impose indirect drivers or controls on economic activity. And those economic activities impose pressures. Um, these might be pollution or climate change. In their best terminology, we call these direct drivers on nature and, and are currently driving its decline. And as I said, at the beginning, this is very uh, consistent with a sustainable development framework and the sustainable development goals. Uh, I'll come back to this uh, towards the end of the talk, but I like to use the sustainable development goals in a ring like this around a local space, in this case a coastal area, as this is when they become very tangible and we can really understand the depth of what can be done thinking of sustainable development through these goals. <clears throat> Now, through IPBES's Global Assessment, which was released in 2019, this was really our signature report. We uh, expanded on 
our conceptual framework. We used the Nature's Contributions to People framework that was developed a few years earlier. <clears throat> and this identifies 18 classes um, of contributions uh, that we depend on uh, in society, from hab habitat creation as number one to maintenance of options as number 18. And in the global assessment, we showed how most of these are declining, some of the, them are increasing. Now, the direct drivers is also another area that we have developed um, quite quantitatively in the global assessment. So we identified five uh, direct drivers, so land and sea use change, direct, direct exploitation, climate change, pollution, and invasive alien species. And these contribute to different uh, proportions to biodiversity loss in terrestrial, freshwater, and marine ecosystems. Now, of course, it's, uh, it goes without saying that these direct drivers of decline come from the extraction uh, and the use of those uh, nature's contributions to people that we have maximized through our economic system. So energy, food and feed and materials and assistance. These, of course, are the, uh, the contributions that have been increasing because we have sought to maximize them through our economic systems. And it's this uh, maximization of these three uh, contribution areas that are causing the decline in all of the others because we have been externalizing the costs of extracting those three. Now in this, uh, in this session or workshop we're really focused on uh, biodiversity and climate change together. Climate change is one of the five direct drivers. It was uh, rated as third in line in 2019 but it's rapidly growing in importance as we know from these uh, very well-known CO2 emissions graphs uh, and the icon up there. Um, and what's important here is that in trying to address climate change, we're beginning to look at two other of the classes of nature's contributions to people, so regulation of climate and regulation of ocean acidification to help us deal with climate change, which of course we have to do, and I'll come back to this later. But the issue is that if we seek to um, utilize these and implement them with the same maximization uh, frameworks that we've used for the other three that we have traditionally used from nature, we will basically uh, go into a vicious cycle of further declines through maximizing individual benefits. We tend to ignore the other benefits that we get from nature. And so that's the central theme of this talk that I'll come back to as we move forward. I think in terms of thinking about uh, the African context um, and the integration that we need between biodiversity and climate change, uh, this graphic from the joint workshop report by IPBES and IPCC together, so these multifunctional land and seascapes or shared spaces, these make really helps us think about how we need to integrate climate, biodiversity and human society to be treated as coupled or integrated systems we need to consider integrated approaches to both climate and biodiversity challenges across land and seascapes. And this needs to be done across 100% of space, of all land and ocean spaces, freshwater spaces. And that's incorporating or including um, sort of the three types of areas you could think of, the mostly uh, unimpacted or wilderness areas um, that might really only be homes and the territories of some indigenous peoples and so on with very low impact on the environment through the intermediate spaces or these uh, and those are indicated in blue uh, in the graphic then the intermediate spaces in yellow where there is uh, pastor pastoral activities or farming but it's um, you can still uh, recognize the the biotic systems and then fully converted zones and ag intensive agriculture and urban spaces where nature is still present but in a very much reduced form and these are all spaces in which we need to think of the integration of nature, the benefits it provides to economic activity and society, and the drivers that we impose on nature that are currently still causing its decline. Now, in the African context, uh, this is work that I've been doing through the Earth Commission in which we've looked at um, Earth system boundaries. And there are two of these related to biodiversity. One is the amount of intact natural habitat on land surfaces around the planet. And you can see from this uh, map uh, of Africa that really the challenge that we face on the continent is most of the continent is already um, less than 50% intact. So all those oranges and reds there. 
deserts are the most intact uh, habitat or ecosystem uh, on the continent, but these offer few nature-based opportunities for people and economic development. Forest and grassland systems are significantly altered, of course, by farming, pastoralism, and other uses. I think of greater interest for us in moving forward and thinking about bioeconomy is functional integrity. So this is of already altered habitats where nature is not uh, in its, uh, you couldn't classify it as being unimpacted. Um, and in these spaces, uh, it can range in quality and the functional integrity relates to the degree to which these ecosystems are able to support uh, nature's contributions to people. So, and here what we see from this map in the middle is that the functional integrity of most landscapes across Africa are actually, is actually quite good. Um, over 90% uh, functional integrity, apart from those oranges and reds we see in West Africa and in Uganda. So altered ecosystems mostly still have a high capacity to support benefits to people. There is high potential for nature-based or ecosystem-based solutions for livelihoods and economy. You could think of this as the bioeconomy, so supporting agriculture, forestry, livestock, fishing or aquaculture. And of course, the need we have now to integrate biodiversity and climate together. There's high potential for benefits from restoration, so very important to think about, the, about how restoration can help not just in restoring biodiversity, which of course is needed in many places, but in restoring function and support to people. A new uh, uh, sort of threshold that has been identified, that we identified in the Earth Commission for functional integrity, is this 20 to 25% of high function vegetation per square kilometer, so in every square kilometer at local scales, to provide most benefits from nature to people. And I'd like to just explain that a little bit more in this slide here. This is the concept of the safe and just future or uh, safe and just earth system boundaries, uh, which have been looked at across climate, biodiversity, nutrients, fresh water and air pollution. And I'll just explore this functional integrity of already altered um, habitats and ecosystems. Um, and the concept here is that the safe component is that these are functioning habitats that provide enough ecosystem services to support needs. Uh, the just dimension is that uh, people must be able to access these benefits for there to be uh, just uh, or for justice to be served. And so we used a one square kilometer scale, so within the activity range of you know, probably most people on the continent. And looking at these six services listed on the right, we identified that 20 to 25 percent of well-functioning or high-functioning or semi-natural habitat per square kilometer is needed. Um, and then this relates to that landscape image that I uh, showed a few slides ago, where we can implement restoration and other solutions within local jurisdictions to assure fit to local ecosystems, communities and governance. Uh, but this must be done over 100 percent of land and ocean spaces and freshwater spaces. Now, in the context of biodiversity and climate solutions together, this is another graphic from the IPBES and IPCC workshop report um, where we need to join these actions together because we cannot deal with these crises separately. The challenge is that, as shown in the upper panel, many climate actions are det detrimental to natural systems, but most biodiversity-based actions can support climate objectives as well. Of course, not across the board. There's many more blue lines in the bottom panel uh, than there are in the upper panel. But the critical thing about these nature-based solutions or ecosystem-based approaches is that these solutions can be effective only if paralleled with strong emission reductions into the future. Because if we undermine the health of natural systems through excessive carbon dioxide emissions, of course, their effectiveness will decrease over time. Now, I'd like to uh, point towards the best nexus assessment, which we are currently finalizing. And this is on actions related to biodiversity and climate change, but also particularly in relation to food, water and health sectors to offer actors solutions or response options that they can implement. Uh, this assessment is coming to the IPBES plenary in December this year for approval, and we hope to be able to disseminate it. Uh, by the end of the year. So coming to the, the bioeconomy. So this is not a term that we use in IPBES so much because we integrate sort of uh, across many different scientific disciplines and those contributing to the bioeconomy debate are one of those. 
But you can see here combining the African continent, this nature economy society model in the middle, and then the 18 classes of nature's contributions to people. Africa's very high dependence on nature-based livelihoods and on all uh, ecosystem services and contributions from neighbor are essentially the quintessential bioeconomy. Uh, our communities, our populations are highly dependent on what would be a buying economy. The problem is that the historical approach to maximize monetizable um, goods uh, and services from nature essentially destroys the other goods and services because we ignore them. And so these are the, the three that I mentioned at the beginning on the right and then regulation of climate on the left. We really risk undermining our entire bioeconomy if we attempt to continue as we have gotten before. And it's incredibly urgent and necessary for us to consider how to balance and optimize across all benefits from nature. And in this graphic, I've tried to illustrate with the green outlines how almost all of the classes of nature's contribution to people are talked about in daily life in local spaces and local government, habitat creation and maintenance, so that could be conservation and restoration, pollination, regulation of air quality, going down to number eight, the formation, protection and decontamination of soils in terms of soil health. All of these are foundations of a bioeconomy and by focusing on balance across all of the contributions from nature to people and balancing this nature economy society, sustainable development model in the middle, Africa could really reap the benefits um, of its ecosystems into the future. <clears throat> One element that's critical to talk about that I haven't mentioned yet is finance. And how do we bring finance for nature-based solutions for restoration, rebuilding nature into this space? Now, financial capital essentially represents um, the accumulation, the value, and then the accumulation generated from economic and societal activities. Um, that builds up over time and of course we use it to invest in societal and economic uh, activities and assets and also in nature as well. But wealth has been generated from converting nature and resources via economic sectors. This accumulates as financial capital up at the top. But the problem is we can see that the overconversion from natural to financial capital has caused nature decline as well as climate change. So then the challenge is how do we get financial capital back into natural capital, which is, of course, uh, top of many discussions now and discussions on the global biodiversity framework and so on. So reinvesting or returning finance back into nature, it can mitigate climate change by sequestering carbon. Of course, that's a big focus now, but of course we have to do this right. Uh, and in that sense, the integration uh, for a bioeconomy of climate and biodiversity solutions are essential to restore biodiversity while attempting to mitigate climate change. We can integrate sustainable production with biodiversity climate objectives, and we can rebuild the productivity of natural assets to provide all the other services or benefits in those 18 classes of nature's contributions that people are dependent on. And here a critical uh, opportunity is this 20 to 25 percent of habitat as a minimum per square kilometer to promote co-benefits across all services. Remember in very intact ecosystems the amount of uh, sort of habitat will be well above this 20 to 25 percent level. That's good. We shouldn't try and go down to this limit. It's a minimum above which we should remain or rebuild towards uh, and continue that process into the future. So some recommendations to finish up on a nature ecosystem based uh, safe and just future for climate resilient development. I'd like to just leave you with these final thoughts for your discussions. So due to the very high dependence of rural and urban African populations on nature based livelihoods or ecosystem services, bioeconomy based on full sustainability principles is, I think, the key solution uh, to the challenges that we face in the future and to long-term prosperity for, for the African continent. We need to balance and secure benefits across all classes of services. So these are the 18 classes uh, we've identified under the IPBES framework. And we need to assure just access to benefits and allocation of finance in the interest of indigenous local communities and residents, so in equitable ways. Now, when we come to thinking about investment in climate solutions, 
Well, these must not damage ecosystem integrity and they must not reduce the multiple benefits from nature to people. So, uh, these must build on and strengthen all of these and do them uh, at the same time uh, together. So applying a minimum 20 to 25 percent high function habitat per square kilometer to consider climate and biodiversity solutions uh, may be a key guideline or rule of thumb uh, for moving in the right directions and improving over time as, as, uh, as knowledge of a system improves. We need to co-develop climate solutions with rights and stakeholders locally. And then most importantly, we also need to assure control and ownership of biodiversity that is restored in locally appropriate institutions to make sure that um, the productive capacity on African landscapes and seascapes and waterscapes stays uh, in the hands of local communities, local governments and the national governments in the interest of, of future prosperity. So I hope this has uh, been interesting to stimulate some of the discussions and I look forward to, to hearing uh, the recording afterwards and I'm very happy to respond to any questions there may be subsequently. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much, colleagues. Um, Dr. Bure is not here, but uh, what we'll do is that those who have questions, we will have a panel, as I say, that will respond to some of the topics and issues that uh, has been raised in this keynote. Uh, most importantly, also, um, if you have questions, we will also have during the panel, after the panel, we'll have a time for colleagues that might want to uh, ask questions, both online and physically, uh, those who are here with us. So please just note them down and um, we will pick them up. I would like now to um, uh, hand over uh, the session um, for the panel discussion to my colleague, Joe Ageo. I just want to check if Joe is online. Is Joe online? Yes, sir. Yes, I am here, Dr. Osani. Okay, Joe. So uh, the floor is yours. Uh, I suppose, of course, you uh, saw the keynote presentation. You have a panel uh, uh, team that is already waiting eagerly. So over to you. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Osano. Um, and uh, good afternoon, good morning. Um, all time zones observed. I, my name is Joe Ageo. I am a journalist, environmental journalist, and also an editor based here in Nairobi. And we are going to uh, start this in a moment, but I wanted to just uh, quickly uh, introduce the really eclectic panel that I have here, who are going to help us to tie the end really, because as uh, our keynote has already indicated, uh, there are many issues that we'll need to discuss us across the triple planetary crisis that we are dealing with. And let me just uh, go straight to the panelists that I will have. Professor Cromwell Lucorito is the Vice Chair, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, uh, Working Group 2, and also a professor at the University of, of, of Nairobi. Um, there is a detailed bio that uh, I'm going to take the liberty to, to not go through, but to just say that uh, I will be benefiting immensely from the expertise of Professor Lucorito during this, this session. Uh, the next uh, guest that we have that we'll be speaking to is uh, Mr. Thierry de Oliveira, who's uh, from the United Nations uh, Environment Program, is currently heading the Regional and National Assessment Unit in the early warning and assessment division uh, of UNEP. He, he, I think I saw him on the call, so he's going to be uh, talking to us in a brief moment. Uh, Linda Kosgei, Head of Multilateral Affairs Directorate at the Ministry of Environment, Climate Change and Forestry here in Kenya, will also be joining us in, in a short while. She's a distinguished, <coughs> excuse me, a distinguished environmental law expert and advocate currently serving, as I mentioned, the Head of Multilateral um, Environment Agreements Department at the Ministry, and, and a detailed profile uh, is there that I'm sure the participants will be uh, having access to. Uh, next uh, is Dr. Olufunso Somorin, Regional Principal Officer from the African Development uh, Bank, where uh, he leads uh, the work on climate change and green growth in the 13 countries uh, where the bank uh, is to be found. And last but not least, uh, we'll be speaking also to Ms. Patricia Combo, a youth negotiator, United Nations Convention 
to combat uh, this certification, UNCCD. And uh, I don't know how many of my panelists are, are here. I did see some of them already, and I do hope that um, some of them might be in the room there. But let me just uh, start very quickly. Dr. Obura did lay uh, a foundation, I think, uh, through a, lo a lot of things that us uh, to consider as we start I wonder whether we could get some reaction, some uh, thoughts, some things that stick out for you, Professor Lucorito, as, as you listened to uh, the intersections that Dr. Obura talked about, nature, uh, economy, society. I wonder what, what stuck for you and, and what perhaps you would like us to reflect on as we begin. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Joe, and colleagues online. First, I want to appreciate uh, the Dr. Bura's um, fantastic exposition of um, the subject that is before us. And he adequately articulated the interconnectedness of the environmental subsystems, placing humanity at the core as a user, as an exploiter of uh, the resources deposited within the environment. He elaborately looked at the issue of a subcomponent where life is possible and adequately turned around the benefits of managing it well and the consequences of over exploiting it or abusing it. The issue also which I wish to enjoy in the triple crisis is the issue of air quality, which uh, of course he didn't touch much on it, but it comes in because it goes to add onto a load in the atmosphere where now the cooking is taking place for the mess that we are going through, for the price that we are making for the crisis that we are complaining about arising from climate change. It's because of one alteration of the air quality, bringing a pollution issue, before we can now sugarcoat the pollution and call it emissions of greenhouse gases, which are warming the atmosphere, right? So this is very interesting. He took liberty to bring into space the other subcomponent, which is quite essential, and that is the water system in our environment, which we saw it as a repository from his talk of goods and services. It's also a, a repository of some of the threats in terms of the gases that we are seeing from the atmosphere, as indeed a reservoir, a pool of some of these harmful gases from the atmosphere. And where is the human being? is at the center striving for economic development on the one hand, striving for livelihood on the other side, and as well as trying to give himself a sophisticated lifestyle. All of this comes into that space of the economy which he adequately addressed it. But when I come in, are we talking about a triple crisis? Or are we talking about one thing? I think we call it triple because we have deliberately compartmentalized our environmental system, which is supposed to be one, handled as one unit. Whatever you think about should not be thought of in isolation, but as one entity. So Joe, I want just to start by framing, re-echoing some of the things so that we can now try to see how do we get inroads into seeing how we can then avoid the triple a, 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 a crisis that uh, we are talking about? Th th thank you very much, uh, Prof. And uh, interesting uh, that your 
wondering whether in fact it is one crisis because we are talking about one one system and, and i think that to be something that the participants will be reflecting on as as the as the day wears on uh, let me get some quick uh, reactions as well from mr thierry de Oliveira. if if you're in the room could you kindly just give us your quick thoughts um and, and not in too much detail but really just what stood out for you yeah, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Gayo and colleagues. Um, and thank you very much for the explanation. Very good explanation of uh, uh, Dr. Obure who's really set up on the um, on this discussion. But for me, is uh, what's um, interesting is the intersections between the economy, uh, society, and nature. And as an economist, I must say that we have um, really uh, imposed on society and uh, on us and, and actually also on a poor community, uh, this, uh, this economic hypothesis, this economic ideas of growth by any means, by all costs. And yet I would submit that um, here we should view um, economic embedded in nature. So what it means? It means that in any case, we are always obsessed with um, development at all costs. We're always obsessed as what's so-called um, the flow of services but we're not taking care of very what embed our lives, which is the stock of nature and how, how depleted and by our actions it becomes. And eventually it will become unsustainable. So I would submit also that uh, we are obsessed and I've, you know, this is, I've, I'm looking at this, the challenges, I understand very much of the challenges that the governments face in terms of how do you, you know, how do you address economic growth and development objectives? and imperatives with the fact that you need to protect the environment. It is a challenge. There's also another challenge of financing, but I would submit that our numerator here should not be the dollar sign. It should be human well-being. And human well-being encompasses very, very different aspects, health, um, jobs, creations, not only how empty or how depleted your pockets is. So income is but one very small dimension of, of what we're discussing here. And uh, I think that that's so, so I think Dr. Bure is to make it short that's really, um, and we'll have the chance to, to further elaborate on that, um, really try to capture the, uh, the challenges first, but also the need of the intersection interaction between those two elements, i.e. again, uh, nature, uh, um, uh, the environment, but also society. And how do we address that within, uh, and potentially address that within um, our action is, is a very important, and this is one of the things that we're being also very preoccupied in UNEP as the environment mandate of, of, of the world. So I think this is another aspect that I really would like to have a discussion on. Thank you. All right, thank, thank, thank you very much. Um, Ms. Linda Koske uh, from the ministry. I, I wonder if Linda is in the room. I, I'm seeing like uh, she is not there. Um, what about um, Dr. Olufunzo Somarin? I think I saw him a little bit earlier. What, what are your reflections, sir? Right, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, can you hear me loud and clear? Yes, loud and okay. clear, but we also see Great. you clearly. Good. Um, so in addition to what has been said, I, I want to probably bring our attention to what the uh, professor said around the climate nature conversation, the, the, the dynamics. And I thought it was very important because um, Climate does impart nature um, adversely. And on the other side of the coin is that you need nature as part of a long-term solution to the climate crisis. And that intersection is very critical for the way we do work. I work in a development bank, and, and I think it, it's, it, it's a key element of the way we do development work going forward. Um, we have an opportunity to look at um, an integrated problem. Um, for, to some people, there's value in disintegrating them, like unpacking them before solving them. Well, if we're going to be able to respond at scale, I think we also need integrated solutions, whether they are pieces of solution integrated together, or whether we look at large scale type of solutions um, to be able to respond to both climate and nature. Um, and I think the conversation in most the financial institutions is to look at these critical connections and how they impart our lives. Give an example, 
giving an example here, look at the African context. We have a nature-based economy and, and which are directly imparted by climate change. And as we also con have conversation within what countries call nationally determined contributions, and you see that a lot of the solutions countries are proposing within Africa are also largely nature-based solutions. So we, we imparted by the problem, but also there's an opportunity to insert, to be part of the, the critical mass of agency required to solve in the problem. So I'll keep it there for now, and we can talk about what we need to do differently going forward. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you very much, Doc. Um, I don't know if, if is, is Patricia on? Yes. Okay, great. Please, please, um, your reflections on, on just uh, on what you've heard from the keynote speak. Okay, thank you very much. And I would like to reflect on the intersection between society, economy, and also looking at nature-related economy in a in a broad dimension of a, a young African and a young African battling a lot of unemployment. And just as Dr. Obura was speaking, I reflected first the three themes of head of this year's conference of parties. And allow me just to mention them. On um, UNCCD, the theme will be on our land, our future. For COP29, COP29 will be in solidarity for a green world. And for the biodiversity corp, it will be peace with nature. And looking at the, at the three, three themes, what comes in my mind is the holistic approach that we need in addressing the climate crisis and the triple planetary crisis, and also reflecting in the African perspective. I know we've all interacted with the three cooking fire stones. And one, when one stone is missing, we cannot attain the sustainable development goals. So for me, it's about coming together as the three Rio conventions, coming together to pull resources because there is no superior or an inferior, you know, a real convention, all must come together at a table to address the high unemployment rate that we young people in Africa are facing and also to actualize or rather to tap into the potential of nature-related economy. And for us, the nature-related economy, I'm looking at the key priority value chain in the entire ecosystem. The priority, the key value chains in the land sector, in the biodiversity and in the climate space, there's a huge potential that we can tap into to ensure the society, our economy and nature, it's a win-win solution for all. So for me, it's about coming together, working for one planet, having similar solutions because it's a similar problem for the African continent. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Patricia. So uh, very powerful reflections there as we begin uh, our discussion. Um, Professor Lucorito talking um, uh, a lot about that intersection, but wondering whether, in fact, it is not one thing that we are looking at from different dimensions, raising the questions of uh, the value in, in, in looking at, at, at these three uh, crises uh, separately. Uh, there's, there's a great uh, point made by uh, Mr. Oliveira about uh, the, the whole intersection and what he calls flow of services, reflecting on, on, on our keynote speech. But, but, but looking at this as, yes, separate, but, but they, they all come together at some point. Reflections on the integrated problem, again, from the, the bank's perspective and, and focusing on solutions. And then I think a very good uh, wrapping up at the end there by Patricia, uh, youth perspective, um, uh, tying the three Rio conventions together and centering them in our conversation this afternoon. Let me now sort of uh, uh, switch gears a little bit. At the heart of our conversation uh, this afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, is a question of science policy interface. And I think down the road, we will talk about how that then reflects in society. And one of the uh, biggest uh, certainly from a journalist, for example, is how science remains in the hallowed halls of the conferences and in academic journals, but does not impact policy. And even when it does, 
how does that translate? And I'll start with you, Professor Lucorito, and I think in many respects you've, you've uh, alluded to this, but uh, because you're wearing many hats, let me start from the IP, IPCC side where there is the, uh, the question from, from the, 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 the reflections you have, because I think IPCC has been instrumental in this attempt to bridge the science policy gap. Um, I wonder, in your view, what you think the key challenges are in translating scientific evidence into policy on climate resilience, biodiversity, and so on and so forth, particularly in Africa? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Joe. I think that's a very important question because uh, I must say that uh, it's not that our science, even the continent, is inferior. It is not. In fact, it is one of the top-notch products in knowledge that we are producing over the continent. But the question comes as to how we approach knowledge generation. Are we generating knowledge with the end in mind? Or are we generating knowledge and somewhere along the line, we try to uh, constrain it to appear to be serving the interest of a certain end user. I think that's where our science is in a way failing us. So that most of our scientific outputs, yes, they are good for assessments, for evaluations at academic level, at promotional level, but they don't seem to have the target user in mind at the conceptualization of the research problem. Because if we had a mechanism of core design of our research, identifying the problem with the end user in mind, then we are likely to come up with research outputs that uh, will convince the policy process because the policy process wants to be told about the implications of action or inaction. And this, because it came from the very end, not policy, but the end user at practitioner level, then it will definitely be crafted in a way that the solutions therein are going to find a place on the table of the policymaker. And the policymaker will not have a problem because the very end user are already hungry. They are already desirous to get this service because the research will be speaking to the failed need for the same product. So the approach, Joe, I think we need to transform it. Thank, thank you, Mr. Mr. Oliver. Uh, an interesting point uh, Professor Lucorito makes there um, about having the end in mind that uh, we, we do research, then we try to figure out what, or try to force it to fit into the problems. But there's also the if we were to drill it down now to the space of ecosystem-based uh, solutions, bioeconomy, how do these barriers translate in this quest to get sustainable uh, solutions in that space? Because I think as Dr. Obura painted the picture, yes, there are, he called them benefits uh, from nature that, that will need to keep coming, but then there's a the question of sustainability. How does this, uh, that uh, Professor Lucorito refers to, the barriers between science and, and, and policy then translate in that particular space. Absolutely, and I'm totally in, a, in agreement with the Professor Locorito because in UNEP, as you know, we've been for at least the past 30 years and especially the past 15 years now trying to address this issue of science policy interface. Number one, we have also developed a lot of uh, products and flagships such as the Global Environment Outlook, uh, Climate Gap Report, uh, we've did in Sustainable uh, Inclusive Wealth Index, uh, we have, you know, the SEA, the System of Environmental Economic Account Ecosystems. We have a climate finance. Uh, we have also uh, Dr. Samoran who is there. We'll... So it is a problem because at the end of the day, and I've been what, advising governments now for 20 odd years, and every time I go next to the finance minister, he said, thank you very much for this. So what should I do now? And it's always been a question. So the limitation and so also with the financiers because financiers for now, and Dr. Somarin can back me up on this. It's a big question of definitions on in terms of sustainable drawing rights. Uh, what is your ESG? How do we know access managers? 
how do they going to come and 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 and, and report on, on stakeholders on how it is the impact on their financing these big issues on on scaling up why should we invest in innovation why did africa should scale up and jump into what we live progging into using um, um, climate technologies or nature based solutions so the science is very much there i think but at the same time we have not managed or been really challenged to cross over and to speak to decision makers also but also to financiers so um so the the uh, the issue becomes now also what is the middling way middling way in terms of are we going to completely commodify nature i.e. full prices or are we going to make nature the center of economics or center of sorry sustainable development where human human well-being becomes like a wholesome um, approach to what we're trying to 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 translate so to to be able to manage to speak to the finances to speak to the the the, the decision makers and also to 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 speak to uh, finance ministers it's a big it's a big challenge we have had that this challenge uh, at the unep many many times over and 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 it seems it's a big um, um wall to break we are kind of now adapting our language and i think and very much to say also what the youth leader was talking about uh, in terms of wages how do we address uh, headlines economic indicators because gdp is not a very good measure so let's face it so the problem is now how do we translate this into language that is absorbed and understood and applied the problem now is applications the science is fully there and I, again i fully um i'm fully here in board, on board with professor lucarito's uh, ex uh, exposition and, and, and yes we have the science but now i really feel that is is the we have not crossed over well very well in terms of the decision making process thank you so you've mentioned something i'm now follow up this just a little bit you mentioned something about the, the the gdp not being a good measure i think this brings to question the whole uh, fact that when it comes to some of the reports that that we see uh, for, for example, in national accounting systems such as what you have mentioned, we don't see, for example, loss, uh, biodiversity loss, we do not see uh, even climate change, all of these things being accounted for. Um, I mean, you produce groundbreaking uh, reports, the Global Environment Outlook, IPCC does, does a, a lot of work around there. How can these reports really be used to promote the development of some measures, some metrics that that can begin to account for this 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 cost associated with with the losses that we are talking about, and I think even uh, Dr. Bura talked about the externalization of this. How, how how do we get to that point where we truly know what these things cost, even from an economic lens? Exactly. Uh, thank you. This is an ex an excellent question, and I think it's it's a very uh, it's at the core of the the challenge we're facing right now. Because GDP, whenever you see, first of all, GDP is a measure of economic activities in general. So you only see a plus, 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 plus 6%, plus 7%, but we don't see the detriment of this plus to nature, to people, to lives. Okay, so it is very, uh, it is very an, an unsatisfactory measure of human well-being once again. So that's one. And the problem is also, once you speak to a finance minister again, or National Bureau of Statistics, their obsession is what do it do to my added value? How does it, in, in, how does it in, in, impact on my growth, et cetera, et cetera. So once we started to compute nature on those kind of calculations, the, the, the fact that it's not understood is the, and some of them sometimes is intangible in the sense of, you know, regulating services like a wetlands. It's a kidney for water, right? But they're not, the finance minister and investors do not see that chain link of, of, of the impact that a sustainable, a nature-based solution such as wetland will have versus a technological intervention. They don't see, they want the tangible stuff. Yes, so this is where the failure and you see the challenges live. That's number one. So we have, we have that intersection challenge we cannot measure. So comes to your, your point in, in terms of how those, those um, Plaxis such as UNEP we've produced, and also I've been critical in some of those. For instance, we need to be able to speak to a Mr. Somorin. We talk about material risk to financing. We have to talk about financing gaps. Why should a bank, well now for instance, the African Development Banks have green windows. How those green windows should apply? We're working with government of Kenya on, for instance, debt sovereign. So we have instruments such as debt for nature swap. 
how this actually tangible will apply in terms of conditionality to make sure that you conserve and you manage nature effectively because nature is an asset you invest in it so it's not gdp is only taking taking that's why i was talking about flows versus stock before and we are very mindful of flows because economics unfortunately has taught us that but we are not mindful about stocks because once you don't have your stocks your assets your savings there's nothing not nothing so we have we have and you have first also we have failed in that literally and and so so we need to, to again raise awareness and also by the way capacity building is not only because I, I laugh because all the time is we need to raise capacity building of the environment no we need to raise capacity of the finance people and the planning people to understand the languages because we have a language barrier and we have an understanding barrier so I will stop here, but yes, your, your question is really wide right on point. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Samarin. I saw you uh, smiling and nodding. Maybe you could get, I could get your quick contribution to that before I, 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 I send your substantive question your way. No, thank you. Um, I think this is a very brilliant conversation. Thank you, Thierry. Um, so I'm not ashamed to say we are one of the few good guys uh, in the finance community, we're trying to solve some of these problems you've mentioned, but we're dealing with a bigger problem here. So I call it the tragedy of intangibility. We have built a system that is focused on tangibility, the things you can see, the things you can handle, the things you can hold. Yet those things depend on the intangible things uh, for them to happen. So a, a and just like you said, the wetlands, um, you know, the forest, uh, perhaps the, the ecosystem, the regulatory uh, and functioning of, of the ecosystems. We have not been able to consider them as assets. We've not been able to monetize them. And yet the countries of today who are economically poor are those ones who are naturally rich. So uh, we've not been able to use that. And, and, and let me say this, we live in a world today where the financial structures, the global financial structures, the structures that hold the flow of capital, they are, they are unfortunately skewed towards the productive system side of things, as opposed to the natural asset side of things. So countries like ours in Africa are very disadvantaged. And to take that further, if we want to develop some of those nature and we go to the market to raise capital, the interest rate is about three to four times higher than even countries that don't have not those natural assets. So there's something fundamentally wrong with our global financial system and we will need to fix that. So maybe I should pause there. That was the reason I was laughing, but I also want to say we're one of the good guys and, and hopefully we can take this conversation forward. Thank you. Lovely. Let, let me pick up from the good guy part. Maybe you could share some of the what you could call successful by economy stories that have promoted climate resilience, economic growth, uh, because I know the bank has been on the forefront in, 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 in financing some of these projects uh, across the region. Good. Thank you. Um, there is, so first and foremost, I want us to all agree on this call and in the room that whatever we call finance or whatever, whether financial mechanism, whether financial partnership, nothing about finance exists in a vacuum. It is first and foremost nested within the overarching political structures. So money is not a thing that is hanging. Money is nested in the politics. It's very important to understand that. Um, the number two, it, it's important to understand that the moment you create space for something, you have an opportunity to allocate value to it. And what do I mean by that? In some countries, it's fundamental, in fact, in, in, fact, in actually every country, that climate change and nature is mainstream in our development project. We're not going to have the luxury of having development finance or project money and then nature resources or nature money somewhere else we would have to mainstream all of our nature-based uh, interests, nature-based action, uh, climate-based, all of them, we have to mainstream them in all of our spending. So when we build a road, it is not just a road like putting asphalt 
on a piece of, um, you know, a land. It is something that offers us an opportunity to bring it by planting trees along the road, but even farther away from the road. It's something that helps us to be able to look at it as something that connects markets, particularly production sites of agricultural product to consumer side. So in that context, the road is not a transport project. The road becomes an integrated project. And the moment we're able to do that, we're able to channel a lot of resources towards nature and climate goals. So what we've done at the bank, and, and I think we do this in all countries, is first and foremost to mainstream climate change and nature interest in all our development work. And let me give you a bit of context. In 2023, the bank approved $10.6 billion worth of investment across all 54 countries, $10 billion on average. What we did was we set a target that 40% of that must go into activities within each project that are consistent with climate and nature goals. I'm happy to report to you that last year we, we achieved more than 50%. In fact, out of that 10.6, 5.8 billion went into that. So when you ask a lot of people, their notion of climate finance, they think it's about writing proposal to Jeff and GCF. But that is, that's perhaps the smallest part of it. Even in our national systems, even in our country level, we must be able to develop a framework where we account how we have done mainstreaming and what proportion of our total spending are activated, are directed towards nature related actions and, and activities on the ground. That is how to do it. Second point, probably third point as well. We can then create new instruments. We can be very innovative with creating new instruments. So what we've done at the African Development Bank was to create a window within our development finance. And I'm sure many of you here must have heard about climate action window. There was a global call for proposals, and I think many of you responded. And it was a grant-based resources to say, look, if you've got a project, your typical project, but you have an opportunity to make it greener or for it to be nature-based, but it's going to cost an additional resources to do that. We're able to give you grant resources to do that in, in addition to your traditional resources that you've been able to um, structure for that project. And by doing that and putting in a lot of resources, we've been able to approve a number of projects. The resources are not enough, but most of the time what we do is to change mindset that it can happen in Africa. Um, many of times today, most of their friends out, outside in the global financial community, they tell us we have money, but we can't find good projects in Africa. But when we did this particular call for proposal, we had $322 million for Anjo, you will be interested in hearing this. $322 million for adaptation and nature base. We got more than 2,000 proposals were written across 37 countries. They were worth over $3 billion. So the project, the problem is not our ability to write good proposal. The problem is how do we create financial resources for them? And one of the ways is been by mainstreaming it, it becomes a, a way of doing things. But in addition, we can diversify the instrument like grant, equity, loans, uh, but also we can create new partnership. One partnership is the Green, the Alliance for the Great Green Wall of, across Sahel. And that partnership has mobilized billions of dollars and we've seen the progress in doing that up to today. Um, I wanna end by saying it can, we've done a lot more, but compared to what we need to do, we need to do things at scale and at speed. And that's why this conversation is very crucial at this point. Thank you. All right, Th thank, you. thank you very much. And uh, I'll just be checking for any indication that um, is Linda Koske in, in the room or not. But let me go to, to, to Patricia Combo. She's a youth negotiator, as, as, as you all heard her speak so passionately, particularly with regard to the UNSCCD uh, and, and of course with the, the COP coming up in, in Riyadh. But let me, let me, talk, uh, let me take you 
to what the youth expect. Give us a, a perspective here as a youth negotiator, Patricia. What are the expectations of the youth on the questions of integrated climate, biodiversity, land deg degradation? What are these actions that you're truly hoping uh, that you can begin to see and that as a youth negotiator, you actively push for? Uh, thank you very much, Joe. And I'll start by concurring to what my colleague has said. The science aspect is intact, but the problem is practicability, how to ensure young people actually actualize this science and put it into practice. And I know we will be wondering why we have a lot of high unemployment rate and also a minimal number of young people in the land space. Yet we've had this conversation of inclusivity, we've had you know, meaningful engagement, we are uh, meaningful engagement for young people. But the key problem that we have, and it's one of our key expectation, is that we are not preparing young people to fit in the current dynamics. What worked five years ago cannot work well at these times because climate change impacts triple planetary crisis and also high cases of unemployment are very high at the current moment. So it's a question of changing the dynamics and also looking at what fits young people at the current, uh, current dynamics. So our expectation as young people, even as we engage in the conversation about the triple planetary crisis, matters related to nature and also tapping into the bioeconomy sector, it's an holistic approach. It's about inclusive policies and decision making, and more so on entrepreneurial skills in ensuring that even as we negotiate and even as we come up with policies on land tenure, yes, the young people have access to this land, then what next? Do they have the appropriate skills? Do they have the resources needed to transform this land into a meaningful practice for job creation and also to ensure they build um, you know, they build their own sustainability, reduce their vulnerability, and also to ensure they cope at they cope um, this tri triple cl climate, uh, triple planetary crisis. And uh, as a young person in the land sector, I've seen a lot of um, young people who are so passionate about you know just putting things work, but they are very uh, they are limited to access to some of this financing. And the good guy said how the bank is very, you know, helping to ensure the ecosystem, the nature-based solutions are well tapped. But the question is how many financial institutions are willing to, you know, to hold the hand of young person to ensure they they enable them to scale up their MSMEs, their small, you know, initiatives, they, you know, they replicate what they have been doing. So our expectation, even as we look at this, is ensuring there's an holistic approach in everything, mainstreaming capacity building. And capacity building here on this, for young people, is not just going to meetings. It's about holding the hand, changing the mindset, integrating using the AI, using all available resources, tools to ensure, you know, to ensure young people are able to fit in this, this space. And another expectation for young people is we are looking for allocation of domestic resources towards land-based solution. We've seen there's the climate fund for, you know, to tackle matters related to, fund, to climate change, but minimal resources get to the young people. We are looking at land as the only thing we inherit from you know, from our ancestors. And at the current rate, the young people are inheriting degraded landscapes. Do we have a domestic fund that addresses these degraded landscapes so that they can transform, they can, you know, restore, they can have something meaningful from this degraded landscape? So it's a question of resources. It's a question of capacity building, entrepreneurial skills to these people, and designing components and solutions that fit the current dynamics. And uh, on science, we have a lot of science, we have a lot of resources. And the problem that we face, or rather we are seeing with a lot of young people and a lot of stakeholders, they want to give the tangible things to young people. They want to say we've trained, we have done this, we've done this. But the soft skills that will enable these people now to, you know, to stand on, them, on their own and make you know, the next step, that is what is missing. So as we look into policy, into research, into solutions, the question should not be how big 
as this done how the the bigger or rather what the world can see but it's the inner skills that these young people will be able to step and to go you know to advance and scale their issues and as i wind up is on the issue related to unemployment why do we have high cases of unemployment yet we are speaking of how nature has a lot of potential has a lot of resources that young people can tap into and the issue is because in africa the our our curriculum our society only sees land as a mixture of that and you know when you mix with with water so we need to change this narrative and i liked i liked what uh dr obura said about society economy and nature and looking at the three you're asking yourself what can i omit to ensure young people thrive and if you look at them it's like a string you can't cut at any point so science policy resources for young people and inclusive and holistic approach it's not a matter of marking you know just picking the box but ensuring beyond that how sustainable is this impact in young people how sustainable is this policy how sustainable is this idea this decision so that we ensure as we transit the you know the elder generation we are living a generation that is aware that is bold that is well informed that they can make their own decisions and they can also create create a lot of opportunities and looking at africa being a youthful continent it needs an intergenerational value chain looking at these aspects both in the nature in the biodiversity ecosystem in the land ecosystem in the land space and giving a lot of emphasis on land because the land is the legacy that africa we rely on if we fail to protect the land if we fail to include young people in the land spaces in ensuring that they uh they get the maximum uh output from it we will lose our economy we will lose our you know our sustainability and looking at the land i'm reflecting and seeing the land as the only thing that holds uh, us from attaining sustainable development goals when land nature is at peace we will be as we are 100 percent certain that the livelihoods the sustainable development goals poverty will be a minimal and this will be a plus for youthful generation so mr joe it's all about inclusivity right resources and right research policies to feed the current dynamics and also ensuring we put skills and not tangible things that the young people can actually make step out of this entire space Thank, thank, thank you very much, uh, Professor Lukoric. So you have been listening patiently as, as, as a teacher would, and, and you hear the things that uh, Patricia is talking about, capacity building and, and, and all that. Please feel free to comment on that before you answer my substantive question, which is getting back to where we started, which is, yes, there is a lot of, of uh, fragmentation in the conversation. How do you bring collaboration between the climate biodiversity communities to make sure that science truly informs the evidence that we get from science truly informs action across all those sectors, but in a coordinated, integrated manner, because the word here this afternoon is integrated, intersection, inter so many things. How do we make that happen? Uh, thank you very much, Joe, and thank you very much, Patricia, for voicing this very pertinent day uh, concern. I call it pertinent because uh, I, being one of them and the other the seniors in faculty, seniors in policy space, seniors in practice, have really overlooked these uh, youth because we over expect from this segment of society without walking them uh, through the issues of life. The element of mentorship in our systems is extremely weak to absent. And that is where the, the problem starts. Here are a human resource who are well educated. They love technology development and they have appropriate technologies to fix even the climate crisis we are crying about and yet we give no space to them i think that's an issue that all of us need to really reflect around there 
how are we engaging these young professionals in whatever we do? In the climate space, and I'm happy that we have the climate crisis because when our other economies are collapsing, there is growing demand for technology. And I'm happy that the segments, the likes of Patricia are tech generation. And solutions to the climate crisis to where we have put mother nature, technology development and transfer because the old approaches can now not deliver new solutions. So there are opportunities for the youth, but it's us to catalyze them. And the youth must also be available and to be mentored. You know, the pressures of life are pushing the youth too fast. They want to be where we, old generation, are overnight. They are not patient also to sit under a lender. But how do we draw this uh, youth? Because they are our dependents going into the future. How do we make it attractive for them to now come closer to the table where we are exchanging? That's very, very critical. Joe, to come back to the question you asked about how do we look at this uh, whole issue of solution to the triple planetary crisis, which I actually had begun by framing it as three and yet talking about one thing. We are talking about one thing because all these issues, whether we come in from the UNCPD, UNFCCC, uh, UNCCD, we are all addressing a common factor. That is the environment. An environment which is a system. An environment is not an entity. It is a system with some subsystem com components which are interconnected and are not just forced to be connected, but they are interdependent. They are highly interactive. Today we are crying a lot about the climate crisis because it is the turn of the atmospheric space of the environment to complain of the injuries that we have inflicted on it, on the environment. Why am I saying so? You injure the atmospheric environment, it withholds the goods and services we desire in the environment, if it gets so much annoyed, the other side, it will oversupply the very goods and services. So we remain perpetually crying left, right, and center. The biospheric environment is equally complaining. We have put a lot of pressure in biomass exploitation from our environment because of economics. I remember in Kenya, we had at one point a lot of forest cover. Moving from Western Kenya to the city meant going through forests. Today, it means going through settlements and a degraded landscapes. The ecosystem function, that space was operating as a link between the surface of the earth and the atmosphere where the water is coming from has been collapsed. So there is no exchange of even moisture. That tells us why we as ecosystem, we as biodiversity conservators must work closely with the, the climate system people. The economists, you must know that you cannot disentangle development in the sustainable context from climate change. You can't talk about development without mentioning climate change, whether praising it or complaining. You can't talk about climate change without talking about development, because development is also injuring the climate system. And that then should begin to be a debate that then brings a multiplicity of actors on the table, both from the atmospheric environment, which are the climate people, both from the biospheric environment, which are the biodiversity ecosystems people. We need the people in the marine, in the water systems, 
they must also come here because they have a role. We have the land-based systems. We have the geo systems. All of us need to come to the table and craft a solution for the triple climate crisis. We can't sit on separate tables and a claim for each one of us trying to come up with a solution. Joe, I'm very sorry, that solution will not be forthcoming. And unless we collapse the walls, we collapse the boxes that we have been operating in and think without the box, think without those disciplines you are coming from and come to the common table and craft a solution to the triple climate a crisis. Why? It's about one environment, one people, and therefore we require one front to be able to deliver to a solution that will address this particular issue. And the environment, by the way, is what I summarily normally call it a, a host of the climate system. With how many components? The one I have talked about. Water in both solid and what? In the liquid. So all of us need to be on the table. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, please remember you can ask your questions both in the chat but also in the room and I'll be giving uh, us that opportunity in a moment. So as I, as I ask uh, Mr. Oliveira one more question, please make sure that your question is uh, already on the, on the chat. But also if someone in the room is ready to ask a question, we will do it uh, as, as soon as we do that. Uh, Mr. Oliveira, there is a, a point I think that uh, Prof is making there about uh, cooperation more generally and UNEP, of course, you have a role also of coordinating countries in, in some respects. Where do you see the role of multilateral cooperation in, in advancing uh, bioeconomy, a bioeconomy that is uh, inclusive, especially in Africa where there are very specific climate uh, vulnerabilities. I don't know uh, what reflections you would have with regard to that. I know multilateralism has become challenging in its own ways. Indeed. Uh, first of all, we have to, uh, uh, the big issue in terms of multilateralism and, and also uh, being in this international era organizations is all countries are not homogeneous. They're not the same. So they come from a different standpoint. Um, um, if you wit, some of the, if you looked at the, 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 the recent uh, climate, uh, the recent COP, COP that happened in Dubai, what was the issue? The issue was that developed country asking, and now I'm talking about now the climate fund, asking, well, you know, to Africa, well, you need, you need now to meet up the challenge and, 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 and really started to, to, to address your issues of, of environmental degradation, climate change. African countries said, yes, that's very good. It's excellent. But the problem, we, you have already done these years, all these years of industrialization, pre-industrialization to get where you are. You want us to leapfrog without giving us the means. So this is a case in point where the, the disharmony happened. So the issues of, of coordination becomes more of a challenge because the needs are different. The level of development is very much different. And the ask is very legitimate. Now I'm looking at it as a, an African myself, but also in, in, from, from the perspective of African countries. So uh, um, um, it, it becomes, and you can see now on the dialogues happening in every fora, whether it's CBD, CCB, all the COPs, where it becomes, and then you have another layer, two layers actually. One is the layer of financing. Uh, again, I will refer to these Mr. Somorins, Dr. Somorins of this world, where we'll say, well, this is all very good, but we're not understanding your requirement in terms of, 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 of finance, you know, because we're not understanding your language. We need tangible, we need what they so-called materiality in investment. We are not capable of still bridging this because so that's another dimension. And the third dimension is the youth. And I'm now referring to my young sister when she was talking about, uh, you know, the need for employment and how you are looping it in this and, you know, uh, um, you have done all these damages and we're paying for you. So the issue again is, and, and I've, I've had the chance to, um, to, um, to assist uh, a, um, a, a big meeting on the, organized by the African Union and the European Commission on innovation. And I met a lot of young people, great startups, great minds, but guess what? They have no access to finance. Why? because they lack the, the, they lack the way of, of, of writing bankable projects. This is the soft skill they don't have. 
they lack the skills of understanding, well, you know, uh, Mr. Someone will, okay, so what is your KPIs? Your key performing indicators for me to invest on you. So you have also certain obstacles that we have not managed to, 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 to um, put together. So in multilateralism, you have those three or four dimensional discussions going all at once, but are completely misaligned in terms of needs, requirements, timelines, time etc. And then you have another one where we are failing in terms of ecosystems doesn't go as fast as budget. You see? So the ecosystem doesn't go as fast as budget payments, the cycles. So you have very impatient people who are saying, well, you know, how much return I'm going to have in a year? 4%, 5%? It's not possible because the ecosystem doesn't take that long to regenerate. So we have all these discussions within all these different parties of, of, of organization discussing, and the coordination becomes even more challenging. So uh, uh, um, uh, um, to me, is, is again, uh, and I, I will hark back again on what I said earlier, it's an issue of discussion, ali aligning our expectations, aligning our time horizon, and aligning the needs because we're not homogenous. So, you know, and we need to address these, but all simultaneously in a simultaneous manner. And then of course, addressing this huge gap with is the youth, you know, uh, um, um, because they need an ask to, to, to pay for what we have done. We have not, uh, we are now bequesting to them. So these are, these are the challenges I, as I see. And again, is, is, uh, I cannot offer an immediate solution, but it's at least, a, you know, it's, it's just, the fact that evidence is in front of us. So I think we should put now our needs, our means and our heads behind this to address these disparities, these various conversations we're having in a similar manner, but yet we are not arriving to a converging point. So we are not converging. We are not optimal. In fact, we are very suboptimal. Uh, and then we are not making headways also in addressing certain challenges that now are, 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 are affecting the youth. So I will stop here. Thank you. All right, all right. I, I, I did promise to open this up, but uh, Dr. Samarin, I think the, there's a point that's been made there about all these barriers that seem to be there, whether for young people or sort of things that challenge the traditional ways in which, for instance, uh, whether it's uh, government or different organizations have engaged either with the bank or more generally on financial matters. And that now that you have a totally different uh, challenge here called climate change, that has its own logic. To what extent has this challenge, the, the many challenges that, 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 that Mr. Oliveira talked about been a reality for you at the bank and what practical ways um, is the bank having to change in terms of the ways of working to make sure that this new problem does not run into barriers that are a factor of how the bank has always operated? Thank you. Thank you very much, Joe. Um, and it's always difficult to speak after Thierry because he tends to put me on the spot. Thank you very much, Thierry, for that. Um, look, unfortunately, the financial system on the continent as today was not built to support the, 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 the desire and the ambition of young people. Um, and across the spectrum of countries, you know, um, it's really difficult to get access to capital. So for a few countries that have been able to promote youth-led entrepreneurship, uh, whether in the nature space or within the broader ecosystem, uh, economy, they've largely done that by having access to patient capital within the government institution as a start. So, um, and I think it's very important. And Patricia, and Patricia, I know you very well, and I know the work that you do. I think we should change the narrative and get to a point where there should be a national youth fund uh, in in any country. Um, and, and I and, and I want to say a very active one, not those ones that are in the media and nobody knows how they operate. Nobody has access to them. We just keep hearing about youth fund and everything. I'm talking about a very active one led by young people and governed by young people who are very much interested in the areas of interest of real young people. So it's very important. What that kind of fund should do, and look, if you have that, AFDB and other partners, philanthropies can provide resources into that fund. What that fund can do is to take you from an idea stage of, of entrepreneurship, help you to 
move a step forward so that you get to a point where financial institutions like commercial banks can then begin to come in and do business with you. So we are, we're, we're, we're jumping steps here. In the absence of that, that type of capital, it's gonna be hard for somebody to go straight to the financial institutions. So what we've done in the bank is just similar to what we've done around mainstreaming climate change. We have mainstream job creation, youth job creation in all our projects. And I can tell you, I have been privileged to be in this region and I've been part of hundreds of projects. And I can tell you within even our procurement system, there is room. We, we have built roads where the, the tree seedlings were produced by a community of secondary schools and youth-led uh, entrepreneurship. There are a number of opportunities. I think sometimes the, the, the disconnect is its information, you know, just to be able to have a timely information. In some cases, we as a development financial institution, we're trying to bring partners around the table to consider creating uh, youth entrepreneurship and investment banks. And some of you may have heard our president talk about it. We're piloting it in Nigeria, we're piloting it in Liberia. And the whole idea is that you have a financial institution that is structured to respond to some of these ideas that we're talking about. But if you don't have that, I think it's important to recognize that there's a level you have to get to before you, you go to the bank. And usually, and we've seen that model in South Africa, where there is a small grant office where you can approach. So, um, Joe, I, I, I'm hoping that you can also use your voice. So beyond being a moderator on this call, um, I think you can also build on your agency to see how do we have a functioning youth-led, youth-managed, youth-governed fund system that is responding to the issues of today. Thank you. All right, thank, thank you very much. Uh, challenge taken and there is uh, there's a question on the chat, but I'm told also there are questions in the room. So how we're gonna do it, we will, I will read the one on the chat just now, but at the same time, uh, I'll be allowing the people in the room to ask their questions so that we have maybe two or three questions at once and then we can answer them and see if there's another opportunity for a second round of questions. So the question I see on the chat is from Karimi Kinnoti and um, the question is what advice and it's directed to professor Lokorito, what advice would you give for bringing the three rio conventions into one consolidated discussion negotiation going forward given that their mandates intersect so hold on to that question let's see whether there are other questions in the room then we can take it all together Are there questions in the room? Yes, uh, I think it's more of, more of a comment. Um, just want to bring up- uh, If you can introduce here. yourself, that will help. Oh, okay, sorry. My name is Anderson Kebula. I am uh, the program leader for energy and climate change at the Stockholm Environment Institute based here in Nairobi. So my comment is, uh, I believe right now, the whole journal community, the government, the of financial institutions, much focus has been on development. And this development has brought about a vicious cycle whereby we bring in innovative ideas, solutions, and when it's about for those solutions to take them to scale, Funding stops. The community goes back to their original, you know, mad practices. So why not look at a model whereby instead of developing proposals for development, we develop business plans? Because by talking about bringing in the issue of business and entrepreneurship, their funding would be like a startup capital to spur those, you know, um, initiative. And then why that, is, why that is ongoing, those small businesses will not be generating capital or funding to now take those uh, innovative solutions to scale. 
because that will now create sort of a market-oriented solution whereby there will be demand and goods of those services rather than sticking to this model whereby we have very good ideas, but when it comes time to scale, the funding stops and then nothing moves. So that's just okay. a comment which I just want to throw on the floor to see if there, there are any uh, further addition from the panel on that. Thank you. Thank you. Let me check if there's at least one more question in the room so that we can take three or four together. Could I get that uh, indication? Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Steve Lorette from uh, Kenya Mission to UNEP. I just have a comment and it's based on uh, uh, what uh, Professor Locorito talked about, uh, breaking the walls and the silos. And uh, I think that was mentioned by all the panelists. Uh, would you uh, think that uh, what the world decided in 2012 during the Earth Summit, the Rio Earth Summit in 2012, that we need to uh, strengthen UNEP, be a solution? Because uh, when UNEP was created in 1972, it was to bring all these efforts together. And uh, we have the multilateral environment agreements now operating and having their own mandates. But uh, now we are saying now these they have become silos. Can we, can you comment on how this uh, could be a solution and how do we go about that? Thank you. All right, thank, thank you very much. So, so three questions. Professor Locorito, yours um, is about how to make these conversations truly one, even at the level of negotiations, considering that their mandates uh, um, overlap. Uh, Anderson, I think that's the name. He, he said he had a comment, but I think it ended up being a question around the, the issue of um, how these projects are financed, they start and then they, they can't scale, they, they collapse because he believes business plans or some kind of entrepreneurial approach would be more, would be more effective. And then um, uh, Mr. L L L L Stephen talks about whether indeed strengthening UNEP, which I think partly happened at Rio Plus 20, but he, he is asking the place of that. So here's where we're going to. So Professor Locorito, you take your question because it was directed at you, and then I think the business plans, entrepreneurship question. Uh, I would I would send it to Dr. Samarin, uh, but any of the panelists really could 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 weigh in. And then the the question on strengthening UNEP, whereas it appears to fall on the laps of Mr. Oliveira, but I think it would be fair for the other panelists to weigh on it as well. So let's start with you, Professor Locorito. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Joe. Uh, that's a very interesting question. Interesting in the sense that uh, it's not uh, only Mr. Karimi seeing it. I also see it from that angle. And from where I come from, the IPCC, it's a matter of concern. And I believe also within the framework of IBES, uh, Dr. Uh, who gave us a very interesting uh, uh, a keynote, uh, really alluded to. In fact, looking at uh, uh, Professor, I mean, Doctor's uh, contribution in the morning, the director, you could not know from where he was coming from, listening to him. It's very clear that you could draw a boundary <laughs> to say this one is not speaking authoritatively for the uh, UN Climate Convention. He was squarely in the side there. He was squarely articulating issues in the UN CBD. And when you look at the land-based system, he was still touching on the land degradation issues, where we know one of the key drivers is, um, is the drought, which is climatic. So we are actually trying to look at these issues and say, can we do 
a critical analysis of areas of commonality. Even if we don't collapse the conventions, but we have cross-working, cross-working approaches, because I know what it means by one fronting the agenda of collapse. That may not be popular, but we can actually be innovative enough to bring in a proposal of cross working what uh, themes are, that actually go across the three UN what convention so that they are coordinated from one level. Today I see the UNFCCC laying focus on tree planting, but they are not telling us which tree to plant, where to plant it, and for what purpose. Those to me are fundamental questions which need to be answered by people from the UN CPD. So if we had those crews working a kind of collaborations, then we are not going to mess up as we speak today, our savannah ecosystems, which occupy the greatest space of Kenya, of Uganda, of Ethiopia, of Africa with trees. But you want to see, can the UNCPD tell us which trees, which must be indigenous to those particular ecosystems that we must take there? Not because we have targets of 15 billion and we are taking inappropriate trees in our rangelands. That is really fast tracking a lot of biodiversity loss, which then comes to hit livelihoods and in the long run, also hit our economies. So it's doable. And I want to say that uh, as we speak now, a lot of reflections are already underway around this particular subject, both from the climate end, from the IBES end, and from the CCD end. There's a lot which is not visible that is going on. And I believe, uh, Karemi, soon or later, we may begin to see some of the outcomes coming through because we are tackling the same mother nature. All right. About Thank UNEP, you. as I finish, uh, uh, Joe, because they are related. Why UNEP? And not any other UN system. UN carries the letter E, and that's the environment. And all of these things, like you are saying, can without any fear be collapsed in the environment and nothing suffers. So even the coordination mechanism, I can almost see that uh, UNEM, even the current rethinking, still stands a high space, a high chance, I mean. Uh, back to you, Jira. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Somarin. You could answer the question around business plans and and entrepreneurship startup capital those were the key phrases in that question good thank you thank you very much if i got the question correctly it's talking about a kind of a bottom-up approach i suppose a development top-down ab type of intervention is that correct yeah, so, so, sort of, um, I mean, if you want to finance uh, any of these projects, that the people there have a proper business plan that you know that this thing can be sustainable way after whatever initial capital was there, that the initial, cap uh, the initial uh, financing becomes sort of like startup capital, but then these things can continue way, way later. And, and, and he's absolutely right. And I think that is a comment because indeed, when you think about a huge development intervention, costing let's say about $200 million in, 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 a, in a county or in a community. That is an injection of capital that can be available for small scale service providers to be part of the entire development, the entire implementation of that pieces of work. So whether you're su supplying any of the uh, um, related needed materials or you are part of providing services, um, within that. And, and that's why I alluded to the fact that it's also very important for many uh, young um, entrepreneurs to understand 
local procurement systems um, and be able to see. Today, you are able to get a sense from, of the investment or projects that will be that are financed in any county in Kenya um, through your close interaction with county government. And we can actually have access to this document. Once you know the financiers, you can have access to the document. And the entire activities to be financed, they are available. And you can actually build, you know, if any of your uh, existing enterprise is able to respond to any activities within that, that is an opportunity because that intervention becomes a capital that is, a, uh, that is able to trigger uh, local micro level um, engagement on the ground. And then it's always, well, unfortunately, most of the time is a missed opportunity. But also, Joe, it's also important that as we do that on the demand side of capital, we must also talk to our government at the supply side to also prioritize the use of local enterprises, local services, and in a way that not everything is done by the foreigner or the foreign company. There are things that can be done locally and you don't need a Chinese contractor to do everything. So it, it's gonna be a balance of, of both sides. Lastly, um, uh, uh, Terry, I, I wanna put a question across to you. I, I've always asked myself, is UNEP like UNDP? Um, I have a feeling that they are structured differently. Um, because I think if UNEP were to uh, be a lot structured like UNDP with a lot of capital base, you are able to do uh, operations on the ground, but also you're able to shape global ideas. So beyond uh, the programmatic and the policy conversations, the convening, um, you know, I, I, a lot of questions have been asked about the UNEP of today, if it's fit for purpose, uh, particularly given the complexity of the crisis we're dealing with. Just a thought, thank you. All right, I, I, I know uh, Mr. Oliveira will probably need the whole day to answer that question, but I will give him a chance to, to just comment on this very issue as we draw to a close uh, in this conversation. Well, thank you very much. Anyway, uh, those are very tricky question and tricky question as well, because it comes also from a standpoint of knowledge. Number one, and also I'll tie it in to the question of, of uh, whether, uh, um, uh, from the gentleman uh, there in ICRAF, whether we should strengthen UNEP. And um, um, number one, UNEP is not structured as UNDP. First of all, UNEP, despite the global convener, so our mandate is to, you know, to keep the environment under review, we have a really convenient, convenient role. So we're convening role. We don't, we're not, uh, UNDP has a very much operational role. So it would be very, I would say, because they're impossible to have the types of, of, of operations that reach than UNDP has. In fact, uh, for um, a case in point is most of the regional and country uh, operations we have, we go through UNDP, or now what we go through so-called reg um, regional or regional coordinator. So very much so. So again, and I will also agree and tie up with what the professor has recommended. I think where we could strengthen UNEP, I mean, even based on the summit, because UNEP has introduced a lot of issues, the issue of green economy, based on sustainable development. That discussion is now ongoing. Um, you know, uh, um, sustainable livelihood, um, all these. But we need to be mindful, and this is also where politics comes in. We need to be mindful where that we need to keep our convenings role because the convention has also a very strong role, especially as inputs of, of the specific areas. And, and so I think that we need to straddle that line very carefully. And I think, but still uh, um, remain humble you know, and then say we still have the convening role, but strengthen at that level. And when strengthening comes for me, and uh, you know, uh, um, all these years I've been in UNEP, it is also this issue of financing UNEP. You know, you can ask, you can strengthen as much as you want, but you know, remember UNEP's funds are all based on pledges. Pledges does not translate to automatic funding. So we have that 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 a bit that financing weakness, I'd say. That's the operational and linkages to UNDP was a much more operational. Our budgets are are dwarfed compared to what the UNDP has. So we have to keep, we have to be humble and also be, be careful of, of, of where, how far we want, to, we want to go. That's number one. Number two, I just want to go back to quickly address this issue of business plan. Um, I agree with the question and also uh, to add with uh, uh, what Lofundo was talking about is this, you know, when you, 
innovations has embedded in it the notion of risk and failure right from the start. So if you're going to ask for financing, we have what we call at some point value of death, i.e. that you have not crossed the threshold of scaling, that you have won. So if you're going to design a business plan, please, especially the youth, and I keep on saying that, please calibrate your ambition. Ensure that also you target the right funds, i.e. Uh, also the talks about patient funds. You know, you have venture capitals, you have, you have impact funds, so, you know, social impact funds. Ensure that you target the right source of funds because otherwise you're not even going to make it at the, uh, you know, at, even at the local levels. And also first test your ambitions, i.e. if you're going to do, do Kisumu, Kisumu, don't go national. You know, we're working on, on a wastewater recovery technology right now. So we're using Kisumu and uh, Machakos. See how it works because it's different. And yes, I agree. And, and contact local, you know, local government. The local governments are there. The counties are there for that. You know, and then so once you have tested this, then use the regional development banks because they will help de-risk. And now down to come up now if you're going at scale. But as I said again, calibrate your ambition and, and, and make sure you test those grounds before then, you know, uh, going um, uh, 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 one, one level up. So I'll stop here. Thank you. All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately, we have run out of time, but I will give each of my panelists just one minute, if not less, to just uh, give us, for instance, some key messages, and I'm boxing you into this. Looking ahead, we have major convenings in this year, the uh, CBD, COP16 in Cali, the UNFCCC, COP29 happening in Baku, and of course, we have uh, the UNCCD, COP16 happening in Riyadh. What are the key messages that Africa should focus on as they go uh, to, this, to these meetings to ensure that bioeconomy actions are central to both climate resilience and, and sustainable development. One minute each gentleman and lady. Let's start in the room with Patricia and then we can, we can, we can round up on the call. Thank you very much. My key call to action should be restoration, should cut across the, uh, the three conferences because through restoration, we'll be able to address all the global crisis. Thank you. Thank you for setting the pace, Mr. Thierry de Oliveira. Well, first of all, thank you very much, Joe, for a very good and enabling uh, um, master of ceremony. That was excellent. Thank you very much. And thank you for the panelists. Excellent discussion, number one. And thank you for all the colleagues and excellencies present. I would say we don't have any planet B. There's only one planet, right? Let's be mindful to that. Two, I would say that Africa is the new frontier. We have all the opportunities in the world. And we have to seize the moment and we have to make sure that in our negotiations we put forward and frontward what our requirements are in order, in order to you know to to help build a better planet that was it thank you all right uh, let's let's go to professor locorito please one minute uh, thanks joe and colleagues uh, as uh, theory have said we are only talking about one planet earth one environment one e ailing environment requiring one treatment, meaning we need an integrated approach towards uh, uh, addressing climate action, which will answer to a diverse uh, set of patients, and this will therefore require a harmonized message. We need a harmonized message across conventions on environmental management. Thank you. All right, I'll, I will have the money man. I have the last word on this. <laughs> Thank you. Um, this has been a very great conversation. Thank you to the organizers. I want to leave you with one thing. The, the global bioeconomy is currently valued at $4 trillion. The global bioeconomy. By 2050, it's going to be sevenfold increase. We will be talking about $30 trillion. Now, 2050 is not too far away. We're just talking about barely 26 years down the line. The chances are that most of us on this call will still be alive by then. The question is, at that point, what kind of conversation are we going to be talking about in 2050? Is it another conversation of how we missed out? We must not miss out of the, at this. And this is why this conversation is very important. And, but it must also lead us to new thinking, a new mindset, and ultimately a new way of doing things. 
there's a huge opportunity ahead of us and Africa must be part of it and Africa must benefit. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's a wonderful place to wrap it up. We must not miss out. Thank you very much to, to my panelists, Professor Cromo Locorito, Mr. Thierry de Oliveira. We also had Dr. Olufunza Somorin and in the room, Ms. Patricia Combo, a youth negotiator who actually uh, has given us many things to think about for this generation and other generations to come. My name is Joe Agel. It's been great moderating this panel. I will hand you back now to Dr. Philip Osano, who is in the room ready to take over for the next session. Thank you so much, Joe, uh, and thank you so much to the panelists uh, for that wonderful discussion. Um, I will actually now uh, shift the gear. We are moving to the second part uh, uh, of our seminar today. And I would hand over to uh, Mr. Stephen Lorete, the Deputy Permanent Representative at the Kenya Mission to the United Nations to moderate that part, uh, which is going to look at the Global Bioeconomy Summit and the uh, CBD COP16 that's coming up in, in Cali, Colombia. So Mr. Lorete, over to you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh... Dr. Phil Osano, and uh, uh, welcome all to this uh, uh, section. Uh, we are going to have two panelists, and um, uh, we know what the seminar is called, so just to repeat, it is by Economy for a Climate Resilient Development. And during this segment, we want to turn to the uh, turn the spotlight uh, to two major events on biodiversity that are happening in this month of October in Kenya and Colombia. Uh, the 2024 Global Bioeconomy Summit will be held here in Nairobi, Kenya, from 23rd to 24th October. This is the first time that the uh, Global Bioeconomy Summit is being held in Africa. And it is expected to attract more than 500 delegates from all over the world. Uh, as I mentioned, I have two uh, panelists. Uh, we have Dr. Julia Sekuru, and I'm going to introduce uh, them one at a time. So I'll start with him. Uh, Dr. Julia Sekuru is uh, from BioInnovate Africa, uh, ISIPE. And he's a principal scientist and manager, research innovation coordination units at ISIPE, presently by Innovate Africa program and the regional coordination unit of the Regional Scholarship and Innovation Fund. He works on issues related to technological innovation and supports scientific scientists to translate research output into practical uses in society. His research interests include developing interactive learning models, which make universities, farms, and related organizations more productive and the catalytic centers of innovation, growth, and social development. He's also, uh, he also contributes to scholarly work in chemical and uh, bioengineering sciences and supports regular uh, regulatory science and research ethics capacity development. He holds a Bachelor of Science degree in um, uh, chemistry and a Master of Science in Environment and Natural Resources uh, from Makerere University, Kampala, and a PhD in Technology as Innovation Systems and Development uh, from uh, Pleking Institute of Technology, Sweden. He also has a postgraduate diploma in International Research Ethics from University of Cape Town, South Africa, and an MBA in Global Business Management from United States International University, Africa. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, so thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ekuru, for being with us. So, mm -hmm. uh, I welcome you uh, to make uh, your presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Stephen, for that elaborate uh, introduction. We rarely do that at ISIPE, so uh, thank you for that. Um, I don't know that if I can share my screen, but as I do so, I would like to thank Philip uh, for for putting together this uh, 
this meeting and the team at SCI. Um, I also want to thank my colleagues who are with me here. Um, uh, Ms. Valin Mora is right there with you in the room. Uh, thank you, Valin, for coming. And uh, we also have Shira Mukibi, who is our business development manager. She, she's also online. So I will just uh, spotlight the, the, the Global Bioeconomy Summit. And Stephen, as you, you've indicated, uh, we are really super excited. Uh, this is the first time uh, we are hosting the GBS, as we call it, here in Africa, in Nairobi, in Kenya. And uh, we are, we are you know, upbeat about this and hoping to make this a very, very impactful event and also very historic. Um, so let me share with you briefly, uh, very, very briefly, uh, what we are aiming for and hope that uh, uh, all of us in this room will participate in one way or another, uh, either virtually if you are unable to come in person in Nairobi. So the key partners for the GBS are the East African Science and Technology Commission and the Stockholm Environment Institute, um, led by Philip, and then of course uh, ECP, uh, uh, under by Innovate uh, Africa, uh, which is providing the secretariat. We are doing this in collaboration with the International Advisory Council on the Global uh, Bioeconomy, of which I am pleased to be co-chairing at the moment. The dates are 23rd, 24th October. Uh, please mark this uh, dates on your calendar and we will be having uh, uh, this meeting at Safari Park Hotel, which carefully chose it because of its uh, ecological uh, nature. I think it gives us the flavor of uh, of what, uh, what we want to achieve. The theme for our GBS is One Planet, Sustainable Bioeconomy Solutions for Global Challenges. We aim to provide a, a platform to discuss global bioeconomy issues in an inclusive manner. And I'm very grateful for the previous panel you guys uh, discussed already actually uh, by economy. I think the summary by uh, one of our speakers, uh, Olu, uh, 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 Olufonso, I think uh, made a very good summary of, 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 of by economy. Uh, we also want to foster communication and understanding of global by economy. Uh, I'm right now in, in Rabat in, in Morocco where we are launching the uh, the annual trends uh, report uh, for, for uh, on global food systems or African uh, trans, uh, food systems transformation. And one of the uh, recommendations coming out here is uh, the need to communicate more simply, more easily uh, by economy so that our uh, policymakers especially understand uh, the, this global, this by economy. And I think very, very importantly, we would like to integrate bioeconomy issues in global discussions on innovation, climate, biodiversity, and also the SDGs. So I think the upcoming COPs um, are really uh, great. And this, this uh, summit hopefully feeds into that. And then of course, provide guidelines and recommendations uh, for the way forward. We'll be having a range of topics. Maybe let me not go so much into detail, but we have what we call the cross-sectoral topics. Uh, these are more technical areas. We also have impacted environments. And I think this, this could be uh, probably of greater interest to, to, to UNEP and our colleagues in biodiversity. Uh, and then we have what we call the supportive mechanisms. We'll be discussing uh, issues of standards, uh, measurement, certifications, financing, and all that uh, in this GBS. This is the structure. Uh, we do have uh, pre 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 events um, as listed here. Seeding the Future Foundation uh, is 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 one of those groups that 
fund innovations in the food food systems area. They look at sustainability of the innovation of the food systems, and they look at innovation, and then they look at the fact that this should improve nutrition. And then we have the International Bioeconomy Forum, which is co-chaired by the European Union and South Africa. It's a, it's mostly a governmental uh, grouping of uh, a, a few states that are you know advancing advancing the bioeconomy. And I think in Africa, it's only South Africa that's uh, so far a member, and would encourage also other African countries to to join this forum. Then we have a World World Economic Forum, uh, which which is uh, you know launching a new dedicated program on bioeconomy around the world, um, and then we have other meetings by the International Council on Global Bioeconomy. So those are pre events. Um, so the way it is is structured is uh, we have the opening session, then we have plenary one on day one, uh, then we have breakout breakout workshops. We we'll have exhibitions and lots of networking. Um, I think I want to draw your attention to the evening of day one, where we shall have a cocktail uh, and launch of the second East African Communities State of the Bioeconomy Report, uh, which is being worked on right now by um, the, East, the, the East African Commission on Science and Technology and also uh, uh, SEI Africa Center. And then we also want to draw your attention specifically to plenary three, uh, which is dedicated to um, Africa and the global south. And we'll be talking about um, agri-food systems, climate action, and biodiversity conservation, including issues of indigenous knowledge. Um, I also want to acknowledge, I think Eva, Eva, Eva Virgin, Dr. Eva Virgin from SCI's uh, uh, Sweden is 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 also online and and he's very much a uh, part of our uh, East African State of the Bioeconomy report process. And then we'll be having a closing ceremony, of course, and then later on the the last day we shall be having optional site visits uh, to a few places in 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 Kenya. So I think my message uh, this evening is just to encourage us to invite us to be delegates at this conference or summit, and you can visit our website and and also uh, register to to be part of this uh, 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 historic event. Uh, we have a, a lineup of speakers. Um, I think now there are almost sixty, and a very good balance of of gender in our speakers. The GBS is mostly uh, dominated by parallel workshops, uh, which uh, you know discuss topical issues. Uh, we have twenty-four at the moment, and then we have uh, twelve exhibitions across the world uh, that will be made. And Stephen, you already mentioned we expect about five hundred delegates, and uh, also about up to three thousand uh, uh, watching us live. Uh, besides the the three key partners or four key partners, we also have other uh, partners who have come on board. And uh, you can find this uh, if you go to our website on the partners and sponsors page. Uh, you will see all of them uh, on listed there. But probably this is a slide uh, that uh, I want also to share with you what we really expect out of this summit. Uh, um, I think for us, uh, the most important uh, is to increase this understanding and appreciation of bioeconomy in the region and also globally. Uh, I like what um, what uh, Lufonzo mentioned uh, about you know the 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 growing market of of bioeconomy and contribution of this to our GDPs and and jobs uh, and livelihoods. So. Uh, I think our community in in Africa and probably other parts of the world should should really understand and appreciate uh, the role that bioeconomy will grow in our future growth pathways. Um, uh, for, from our side, uh, we want this to lead into uh, bioeconomy policy adoption uh, for those countries that are ready 
uh, and also support implementation of bioeconomy strategies uh, for those countries and regions that have uh, these dedicated bioeconomy strategies. Then the second thing um, is um, we want to increase our momentum for bioeconomy development and, and integrating this into policies and development frameworks. I've mentioned about the upcoming COPs. And uh, very, very importantly is the G20 uh, Bioeconomy Initiative, which uh, has been started by Brazil, and it will be taken up by South Africa next year when it, uh, when it assumes presidency of the G20. So we are looking at all these processes, uh, the GBS in particular, giving us this platform, we will receive you know, some feedback from the, the G20 uh, initiatives specifically on bioeconomy, which has taken place in Brazil. And then South Africa uh, will rally behind South Africa to, to develop this uh, much more uh, next year. And I think uh, next year, the focus will be on programs and, and implementation uh, strategies and, and frameworks. And we want to be very much part of, part of that. Um, and then of course, we look forward to new, new partnerships and potential funding opportunities for different uh, uh, either business ideas or, 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 or you know, different, different kind of things. So, so we welcome you again. Um, again, this is the, the first time we are hosting the GBS. We want to, we have some plans to uh, also make it, flavor it with the African, you know, culture. And so, so this is great for us. And um, already we have received uh, some uh, some call uh, for for Ireland, uh, which will be hosting the next GBS. So we are hoping our team is a bit together with um, Philip's team and and all the others, and of course all of you coming on board. Then uh, let's make this a uh, huge success uh, here in Kenya. Thank you, and I look forward to. Uh, addressing any questions that come, but also my colleague uh, Valin is in the house, is in the room with you. She should answer uh, any any questions you might have, and also take the time to interact with her and learn more about the, the GBS. So thank you very much, Stephen, and back to you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kuru, for that. Uh, detailed and informative uh, presentation. So I think all the participants have uh, understood uh, what we are getting into in a few weeks time. It's about two weeks, I see three. And uh, you are invited to uh, participate, attend, and make it a success. Thank you very much. Uh, the next uh, uh, present our, uh, our panelist is uh, uh, His Excellency Pedro Leon Cortes Ruiz, the, <laughs> the Colombian ambassador uh, to Kenya and the permanent representative to UNEP and the UN Habitat. Uh, he has a long bio. And uh, I've been asked to uh, shorten it. Uh, the ambassador is a uh, holder of a PhD in political science from uh, Howard University. Uh, that must be in the US. Yes. Yeah, thank you. And he has uh, done a lot. Uh, so I'll not uh, go into that. Uh, but just to say uh, Balosi Karibu. Yeah, and uh, I know you've been very busy and I thank you for making time to be with us. Uh, you are preparing the 16th meeting of the Conference of Parties, which is going to be hosted in your country. Uh, and that is uh, on the Convention on Bi Biological Diversity. And it's going to be held in Cali, Colombia from 21st October to 1st November 2024 under the theme of Peace with Nature. 
This will be the first biodiversity COP since the historic adoption of the Kunming Montreal uh, Global Biodiversity Framework at COP15 in December 2022 in Montreal, Canada. Today, we are privileged to be joined by uh, the ambassador. And uh, I wish now to welcome him uh, to make uh, his presentation. Karibu Balos. Thank you, Stephen. Um, thank you to the Estocolm Environment Institute and to the Kenyan mission to the UNEP. Um, uh, thank you for to all the distinguished participants from all the institutions. For me, on behalf of the government of Colombia, it is an honor to be here. Uh, we really appreciate the goal for this event in terms of really beyond COP16 to try to strengthen cooperation between governments uh, uh, and civil society. Uh, for me at the end, negotiation between governments are important, but most important is the connection between the people. Um, for us, uh, COP16 has a very deep significance um, for different for several reasons. Uh, first of all, uh, peace with nature. That's the the name of our COP. Also, is the the COP of the people. And. Um, Maybe you know something about Colombia in terms, of, okay, it's one of the most biodiverse countries in the world. But unfortunately, we have been in an internal armed conflict for more than 50 years. Uh, we're seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. We are in the process of building a sustainable peace. And obviously, nature has been one of the victims of the conflict. It's not just a conflict among people, but also uh, nature has suffered a lot. So for us, peace with nature uh, from our national uh, interests is, is a big deal. And obviously we agree and we are with the vision that the triple planetary crisis uh, is here, uh, is related uh, to the economic model that the world continues deepening, uh, a model guided by extractivism, uh, a model that has not put the people at the center and the nature. Um, so that's part of the reason why is the cup of the peace of the nation, peace with nature, and is the reason why is the cup of the people. Actually, I, we are not going to into details of logistics, dates. We just like to highlight some priorities from the presidency of the COP. Um, and we invite you, if you have not done that, there is a specific website of the COP16. This is COP16Colombia.com. Uh, there is also the website of the CBD convention and all the detailed information about everything is there. Uh, I just want to highlight that in terms of organization, I don't know if it is the first, I think it's the first COP that in terms of organization, we will have a zone for negotiation. It's called the blue zone. But we also, we also have a green zone. Uh, and green zone in the city of Cali is designed precisely to allow people uh, not just to try to find ways of collaboration on advocating before the, the blue zone, but also to have a lot of dialogues of networking. Um, uh, so uh, Colombia and the city of Cali is, is, is eager, is very enthusiastic with that. Um, and um, so in the website, um, you will find all the things. Uh, and I would like to use these minutes just to highlight 
some of the priorities of, of, the, of the COP16, talking as presidency of the COP. Then I will highlight one issue that is related uh, with the position of Colombia as one of the parties. But first, let's try to highlight some of the, of the key priorities that the presidency of the COP will put in the negotiations. So for that, uh, I have the, the, the assistance of Andres Duque. He's part of the staff of the embassy. He's currently the, the, the diplomat in charge of consulate affairs. But before this, uh, he was for many years in the division of the environmental issues in our Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So he knows Nairobi better than me because you have been in Nairobi for a lot of times in negotiations. So Andres, I will ask your assistant just to make some highlights of these topics that are priorities and that have relevant connections with the issue that we are discussing today that is bioeconomy. So just take three minutes and Okay, back to me. Perfect. Perfect, Ambassador. Thank you uh, very much. Um, and uh, what I wanted to start my uh, presentation with was with the overarching uh, theme of COP16, which is peace with nature. And with this question, what is peace with nature? And in fact, you have already answered that question with your interventions uh, this afternoon, because peace with nature is reconciliation through and for the conservation and restoration of nature, as the ambassador has said, not just within countries, but among countries. But it, it is also, uh, as uh, Thierry said, moving away from that economic model of growth at all costs to an economy embedded in nature for us to live and grow in harmony with nature. And that takes uh, reindustrialization and, and that takes a lot of changes into how we relate not just to the environment but also to uh, the economic activities that, that we uh, do uh, with the environment. But uh, peace with nature also has to do with a lot of things that, that Patricia has brought to the fore today, uh, including, for example, the intergenerational uh, justice that needs to be also embedded in whatever we do for the environment right now. Uh, inclusivity, right resources and right policies. This is at the heart of peace with nature. And peace with nature also has to do with something uh, that uh, Dr. Uh, David Abura said, uh, not just this interlinkages between nature, society and economy, but also with this idea that the services that ecosystems provide to us need to be accessible for all people. And this is where uh, the discussions of, for example, the benefits of the utilization of genetic resources come. Uh, and this is also the discussion where it's important to hear the voices of civil society, where it's important to hear the voices of the communities that have for many years uh, preserved and restored the ecosystems, such as indigenous communities and also people of African descent, uh, of which the ambassador will speak uh, further on. Uh, so if I can go to the next slide, please. When it comes to the priorities of uh, the presidency uh, concerning the negotiation, there are several. Um, whenever we can, if we can go to the next slide. Uh, there are several um, priorities that we have, including uh, yes. giving life to the Cumin uh, Montreal Biodiversity Framework, Global Biodiversity Framework. And this will be done uh, through... Uh, the definition of uh, different elements that have to do with the implementation, the monitoring, and the accountability of this uh, global biodiversity framework, including countries updating their national biodiversity plans and strategies uh, to respond to the goals uh, and the targets set in the in the Cumin Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework. This also includes the mobilization of resources, a very ambitious mobilization of resources from all uh, sources uh, in order to fund those plans and in order to fund action for nature and to be able to achieve the goals that we have set uh, as global community for 2030 and 2050. And this is where the financial mechanisms uh, comes uh, to the play. Uh, there is also uh, the important discussion on digital sequencing information on genetic resources. And this is a very technical subject, but basically what this means is that 
For many years, the countries such as Kenya and Colombia that were the holders of biodiversity had the physical samples of the generic resources that were then used in order to create products, to develop medicines, to develop uh, different things that would come to the benefit of uh, humankind. Today, that reality is different. Those generic resources are in databases that can be exploited remotely, that can be exploited through uh, artificial intelligence, for example. And there are many parties benefiting from generic resources on and from digital sequencing information all over the world. And those benefits are not being shared equitably. And this is also when the question of uh, justice and fairness um, is, is important to address. Just as uh, Dr. David Obura said, the ecosystem services need to be accessible for people. And the, the benefits, both monetary and non-monetary benefits of digital sequencing information, they need to be available for the developing world as much as they are available for the developed world. Then uh, we have... Uh, things such as uh, the um, um, synergies with other MEAs, a subject that has been discussed from the very beginning of this conversation. Um, Dr. Uh, Lucarito mentioned these interlinkages uh, in his many interventions, uh, but also Patricia uh, used uh, the, the very good um, allegory of the three cooking fire stones. Um, our minister likes another analogy. Uh, she calls uh, them the three real triplets, um, CBD, UNFCCC, and the UN Convention on Desertification. They were both, they were all born in Rio, 1992. And, uh, you know, for many years, they went their own way as all teenagers do. And now that they are in their 30s, they're finally realizing that they need to work together. They need to come back and then reinforce one another because they are, uh, interdependent. And what we do in one convention has effects in another convention. And we need to think, as many of you have said, in holistic approaches. This idea of climate and nature, uh, we have to stop thinking of it as a dichotomy and start thinking of it as a duality. Climate action is nature, is, is action for nature. And the effects of uh, climate change are also effects on the loss of biodiversity. So when we talk about the triple planet, planetary crisis or the poly crisis or the multiple environmental crises that affect the world, we are talking in essence, as Dr. Lucarito said, of one world. Um, and this is important. And this is something that our minister wants to highlight through this COP16 and, and one of the priorities for the COP16 presidency. And finally, there's uh, the AJ program of work, which uh, Ambassador uh, Pedro Cortez is going to mention. Thank you. Thank you, Andres. Yes, just one minute. I will do it in one minute, what I usually do in two hours. <laughs> just to explain. Yeah, as you know, the, the CBD convention, uh, the article HG, uh, uh, is, a, is, is a call to, to the parties to respect and to promote traditional knowledge, innovation, and practices. At the time that the convention uh, was uh, was agreed, uh, the Article J includes indigenous and local communities. At the time in the Americas, especially in Latin America, the process of people of African descent trying to get recognition in a context of historical racial discrimination and exclusion, again, indigenous people and people of African descent, we, we were not at the front of the political discussion in multilateralism. But in fact, in Colombia, Brazil, and other, and other uh, Latin American countries, the, uh, uh, an important percentage of people of African descent today still live in the most strategic regions for the preservation of biodiversity. That's the reason why Colombia, and I'm talking not as a presidency, but as, as Colombia as a party, has proposed in the, in the meetings of the, of the subsidiary bodies uh, last May here in Nairobi, and we'll do it in COP16, the need of inclusion of people of Africa descent into the implementation of COP16. How we will do that? 
uh, in the context of the different points of negotiation, we are we will do some proposals. Uh, we have begun a process of trying to communicate the rationale of that. Uh, we are working with a lot of the African countries because it's, it's, it's a conversation we, 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 we have begun because sometimes why? Why people of African descent? In most African countries, in the context of the CBD, most feel comfortable in the group of indigenous people. So what we are trying to do is, is, is to push that in the spirit of the article of HG, that is the protection of traditional knowledge. So that will be an important piece of the Colombian position in COP16. Uh, thank you very much again for, to the to the uh, Stockholm Environmental Institute. Uh, we have reviewed your website and you have done a good work in terms of presenting COP16. And we really are uh, very eager to, to interact with your delegation COP16 that I see is a big delegation. So we are very ready to collaborate with you. I will be there in Cali. Uh, and thank you again, because I think beyond COP16, remember, Colombia will be the presidency of the, COP, of the COP, of the CBD for the next two years, for the next two years. So we are hoping to, to the different channels uh, to try to, to advance this, this vision of peace with nature. Uh, and we are ready to, to collaborate with, with you. So thank you very much. And we... Take, we took a lot of time. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry, Stephen. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ambassador, for that uh, presentation. Uh, maybe for me, I would have liked to hear about the people of African descent more. Okay. <laughs> we can't a nice specific yeah. conversation of that. <laughs> yeah, but we really appreciate uh, you for giving us uh, that information and uh, uh, what. Uh, you expect to come out of uh, COP16. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency. I think we have come to the end of uh, the presentation. I think we are just has the time by a few minutes. So uh, I think at this juncture, I now wish to turn back the program to Dr. Osano uh, to continue with the the program. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Stephen. I, I would not, uh, uh, I just wanted to um, take the opportunity. I understand uh, Excellency Ambassador Angote is online. She was to give us opening remarks, but uh, I've kindly requested her to give us the closing remarks. So, uh, Ambassador Angote, the floor is yours. Are you with us? Hello, Dr. Osano, Could, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you very well. Okay, thank you very much and apologies uh, for the delay. I, 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 Something happened to my laptop and it just went mute. Uh, so I think from here, greetings from New York and thank you so much for inviting us uh, um, to be, take part in this event, both uh, in the session here, giving remarks as well as, of course, uh, being part of the sessions that have been going by and we have been following uh, this. All we, we want to say that, um, you know, this gives us a lot of pleasure and we are very happy for this very critical seminar on bioeconomy for uh, climate resilience development. Mm. Um, this uh, for, for, let me just from the onset uh, you know appreciate the stockholm environment institute africa center director in nairobi uh, dr osano for thinking through and helping us to really come together to think through this very key uh, event and for the collaboration that uh, uh, your organization continues to have uh, including in organizing this seminar in partnership with our government and especially with the Kenya mission to the United Nations office in Nairobi and with UNEP. Allow me also to register my appreciation for, for your uh, invaluable support and participation, all the participants here 
uh, in today's event, uh, which is which holds very great potential to transform not just our economy, but our entire vision for sustainability and resilience, sustainable economic growth, social equity, and environmental stewardship, as we have heard from the various speakers in the face of global issues and emerging environmental challenges. Uh, this has accorded us an opportunity, which is a great opportunity really, to reflect on our collective commitment to exploring uh, to exploring innovation for environmental and economic sustainability, as well as exchanging knowledge, information on the biodiversity, climate change, and sustainable development. We look at this as being an opportunity and many other opportunities that will fo follow this uh, to uh, be able to enable us to foster collaborations in tackling of issues uh, that are complex on questions of uh, human environment. The lessons have been rich, have been here and following, uh, uh, um, and ideas as well as recommendations that we will we will take forward, you know, and of course they mirror an urgent call for action. The full benefits of our deliberations in achieving a climate resilient development will only be attained through the effective and collective responsibility in the rational use and management of our resources, including the environment. I am therefore confident that, uh, you know, following this seminar, um, it is going to serve as it's going to serve as motivation for us to embrace bioeconomy as a sustainable model for promoting climate resilient development, as well as an inspiration to further broaden our commitment in harnessing biological resources, knowledge, and innovation to drive uh, our economy excellencies, distinguished guests. Uh, we take cognizance of the critical importance um, of bioeconomy. The government of Kenya has taken bold steps to integrate bioeconomy into our national development agenda, thereby driving climate resilience, promoting food security, and creating green jobs. Our commitment to sustainable development is grounded in the Kenya Vision 2030, which seeks to transform Kenya into a middle economy country by 2030. The constitution of Kenya 2010, which also guarantees every Kenya citizen the right to a clean and healthy environment, as well as the national bioeconomy strategy, which emphasizes sustainable agriculture, forestry and afforestation, biotechnology, renewable energy, and the circular economy to unlock the potential of biological resources. As a country, we are rich in biodiversity and natural resources, and we remain at the forefront of efforts forged to realize sustainable development and climate resilience. In pursuit of the climate resilient development, our government of Kenya initiated the national tree growing restoration. I'm sure all of us here are aware of this campaign, which is aimed at uh, you know achieving 15 billion trees by the year 2032, and investments in the production of biofuels and biogas to reduce the dependence on fossil fuels, which lowers greenhouse gas emissions, restoring forests, improving biodiversity, and mitigating the impacts of climate change. The, uh, uh, in addition to that, the, uh, the East African Regional Bioeconomy Strategy 2021-32 presents us with an impeccable avenue for the achievement of our common East African ambitions of eliminating Western pollution, regenerating the natural systems, promoting sustainable agriculture, forest conservation, and bio-based industries, which are crucial in driving our East Africa as a global hub for bioeconomy innovation. Ladies and gentlemen, our permanent mission, which I head uh, of Kenya to the United Nations Environment Program and UNON is also very critical 
here and will continue to play a crucial role in promoting a bioeconomy uh, that aligns with sustainable development and climate resilience. Through our participation in international environmental policy negotiations and advocacy for frameworks that support sustainable practices and resource management, the mission, our mission, continues to work closely with all stakeholders in promoting sustainable practices and eco-friendly technologies. We therefore remain committed to promoting the bioeconomy transition on the global stage by ensuring that bioeconomic policies are at the forefront of discussions at UNEP and across the United Nations system. We actively support the development of a global frameworks that will advance bio-based solutions to foster resilience and sustainability in Kenya and across the world. Distinguished guests, the attainment of a climate resilient development, uh, uh, climate resilient development requires the active involvement and collaboration of all of us and all sectors, including the key global partnerships, such as UN initiatives, the global bioeconomy coalitions, bilateral and multilateral agreements, regional organizations, research and innovation networks, as well as science and technological innovation. To be able to develop innovative bioeconomy solutions, which are tailored to regional contexts to ensure sustainable growth and environmental preservation. The government of Kenya stands ready to play a constructive role in extending the bioeconomy initiative to the global stage. Our partnership with the Stockholm Environment Institute, for example, here and over the past year have been instrumental in advancing bioeconomy research. And we believe that with more partnerships with like-minded organizations, we'll be able to build a robust foundation for evidence-based policy making in climate resilience and sustainability. It is a great privilege that Nairobi will is playing host to this uh, global bioeconomy uh, meeting of 2024, which is a platform to explore innovation uh, of bio-based solutions for the decarbonization of economies, building sustainable food systems, like I said earlier, and addressing pressing health challenges, as well as showcasing Africa's leadership in uh, bioeconomy solutions. Kenya remains, uh, Kenya aims to create a more sustainable and resilient economy that leverages its rich biodiversity and agricultural resources, and therefore remains steadfast in taking an active role in this. And we are looking forward to do this in forums, including the upcoming, uh, you know, COP29, COP16, and the UN Convention on, on, on Combating Desertification Forums in order to shape the global bioeconomy agenda and guarantee the integration of sustainable use of biological resources with climate action and land restoration. In conclusion, allow me to say that bioeconomy offers of us a transformative pathway for achieving climate resilient development. And therefore, by harnessing the power of renewable biological resources, we can mitigate the effects of climate change, adopt to its impacts, and foster sustainable economic growth. It is therefore imperative that we continue to put up well-coordinated efforts and foster partnerships again, uh, you know, with government as well, with the private sector. <clears throat> sorry, with the government, with the, with the private sector, as well as communities, civil society, in order to realize the full potential of bioeconomy in achieving a sustainable, resilient, climate resilient growth. Together, we can lead the global transition to a bioeconomy, bio-based economy that protects the environment, drives innovation, and secures a prosperous future for all of us. So let us work hand in hand to make this vision a reality. Thank you very much, Asante Nisana. Good afternoon. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador.
uh, we appreciate. I think colleagues, uh, I'm, I'm sorry that we went beyond time, but I think it was worth it. I want to really thank each and every one of you uh, for uh, being available with us uh, both online uh, colleagues joining virtually, we do appreciate your presence and contribution, uh, as well as colleagues that have joined us here physically. Uh, also to thank really the speakers um, and, and the moderators that made this session um, successful. Uh, and most importantly, to thank the government of Kenya uh, through the Kenya mission to, uh, to UNEP uh, for co-hosting. Um, and lastly, and not least, to thank uh, uh, Your Excellency Ambassador um, Leon Ruiz uh, from Colombia. Uh, for really also, I know you had to switch your program to be able to join us. We appreciate and of course we look forward to coming to Cali and to make sure that uh, some of the contribution that have come from here find itself to that discussion. Uh, as a matter of way forward, we will do two things. One, we will have a summary, a synthesis of this discussion, just high level highlights that can be part of your historical record for reference. Uh, and secondly, uh, we are considering that after uh, all these three uh, major events this year have happened, we might uh, have again another opportunity to come together to really reflect on what has been achieved uh, for the uh, you know, CBD, for the uh, climate uh, COP, and also for this UNCCD COP, so that we can find a way in, in terms of supporting action, both in policy, but also implementation. Otherwise, on behalf of the Stockholm Environment Institute, I also wish to thank you and uh, for those colleagues that are here, also to invite you for a meet, uh, greet, and mingle session. Uh, with uh, some bites and coffee uh, around. Thank you so much. And bye to all our online um, colleagues. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.